Tonight we're going to continue on with our study out of the book of Colossians. And of course we have seen in uh, chapter number one about the fact that the Apostle Paul was giving thanks for the Christians at Colossae and for their testimony. And he mentioned that he did not cease to pray for them, that he continued to pray for them, that they would walk worthy of the Lord, that they'd be strengthened with all might. Uh, he gave thanks unto the Father for them and uh, for the redemption that uh, we have. And uh, he talked about the preeminence of Christ in chapter number one as well, that Jesus is the head of the body and uh, that, um, <clears throat> that he had been given, the Apostle Paul had been given the opportunity to preach the mystery that had been hid from uh, the foundation of the earth but now was made manifest to him. And then in chapter number two, we began to look at the conflict that he had for them and for those at Laodicea. He was in a in a, uh, a state of concern for them, that they would not be uh, beguiled out of the great treasure that they have in Christ. And of course, that's applicable to you and me too, isn't it? The fact that we have been given much in the fact that we are in Christ and in Him we are complete. And uh, the Lord doesn't want us to be beguiled out of that great treasure that we have. And so through the Scripture, He's warning us that we should not allow ourselves to be uh, defrauded or, or, or uh, uh, talked out of the great blessings that we have in Christ. That's really what chapter 2 was all about. And uh, he mentioned to them in verse number 20 of chapter 2 that uh, if they are dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, would they be subject to ordinances? And then he ends in ver verse 23 of chapter 2, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So don't allow those things to take the place of what you have in Christ. And then, of course, last week we talked about the, uh, what it is for us to follow the Sabbath day or what, what part the Sabbath would have in the Christian realm. And I hope that you uh, were helped by that and uh, even helped you to look at Sundays the right way, that it's not a Sabbath it's not the same thing. It's a much different thing in that we give it to the Lord and, and, uh, and all of that. I hope that was a blessing and a help to you. But now we're going to get right back into chapter number three, and we're just going to look at the first four verses tonight. I would entitle these four verses, Living in Light of Being Dead. Living in Light of Being Dead. And look with me, if you would, at verse number one of chapter three of Colossians. If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory, living in light of being dead. Let's pray and let's ask God to meet with us here this evening and help us in the study. Father, I do thank you for the wonderful opportunity that you've given us tonight, Lord, to meet together, to have a wonderful time of fellowship. But now, Lord, would you speak to us through uh, the preaching and the teaching of your word. Uh, Lord, I pray that this would be a special time, that it would be an enjoyable time. But more than that, Lord, that we would grow in our faith, that we would learn of you. Uh, Father, I pray that this time would be a help to each of your people. Uh, give me, I pray, wisdom and grace to be able to preach and teach this in the way that you want it preached and taught, I pray. And then give all of us ears to hear and hearts that are humble and tender and ready to receive your word. Please rebuke the wicked one. And uh, Holy Spirit of God, we yield this service to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, living in light of being dead. If I could divide these four verses up into segments, I would say, first of all, that the first two verses are a segment that I would call the command. There is a command that is given there where it says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. The first part of that command is for you and me to recognize that we have or that we are risen with Christ. The, the way it is stated is, If ye then be risen with Christ. So it's a great question then, because of the way that that wording is, to ask ourselves, Are we indeed risen with Christ? Well, we've talked about it quite a bit from the pulpit here, but let's remind ourselves of what the Word of God says. Look with me, if you would, at the previous chapter, chapter 2, and look with me at verse number 12, where it says this, 
buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. We are baptized into Christ, and that is a burial. We have been buried into Christ. When you and I received the Lord Jesus as our Savior, when we believed on him, we were dead with him. And then just as we were buried with him in baptism, we are also risen with him in baptism. Now, one of the things to point out there is this. The baptism that is mentioned there in chapter 2 and verse 12 is not the water baptism that goes on in the tank behind me here. And the proof of that is what it says in verse number 12, where it says, through the faith of the operation of God. It's speaking there not of a water baptism, it's speaking there of a different baptism, and that baptism that it's speaking of there is the baptism that happens when I believe on Christ, I am baptized into Christ. Because remember, the word baptism really doesn't necessarily have anything to do with water. I know that's going to sound strange, but it may have something to do with water, or it just means to be immersed into something. So that something, in our case with water baptism, is water. And by the way, we're not going to start sprinkling anytime soon, okay? Not while I'm the pastor, okay? Because baptism means to immerse. But there is a different baptism that happened that this one in the water pictures. You see, this one is just a picture of what has already happened to somebody who's been born again. They have been baptized into Christ. And as they've been baptized into Christ, that's an operation of God, as it says in chapter 2 and verse 12. And when I believe on him, I'm baptized into Christ, I'm dead with him, and I am risen again. Wherever Christ is, that's where I am. That's the baptized into Christ. So, Am I baptized into Christ? And the answer is yes. Look with me also at chapter 3 and verse 3. Notice what it says. This is part of our text here. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So again, it's very, very clear throughout this scripture that yes, we are risen with Christ. But one of the things I want to point out to you is this. Colossians is not the only book that talks about that. You and I may not think of it very often, but that topic of being buried with Christ and risen with Christ is an important theme throughout the New Testament, specifically the Pauline epistles. Keeping your place here in Colossians, let's quickly look over at Romans 6 again. And I know you, you probably already knew I was going to go to Romans 6 because it seems like every time we talk to, about being baptized into Christ, we go to Romans chapter 6, and I'm glad you thought of that. That means I'm doing my job. That means that next time you hear somebody talk about being baptized into Christ, you'll remember, oh yeah, pastor always goes to Romans 6. That's a good thing, okay? That's what I want it to be. I want to be like that annoying teacher that you used to have in uh, school who would always correct you in certain things and say, no, 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 you don't say snuck, you say sneaked. Right, Donna? See, I had a teacher too. And every time I hear someone say snuck, I say, no, 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 no. It's sneaked. All right? That's because I had a teacher who always said that to me, and that's good. I want to be that teacher for you in the Bible. Every time you hear about baptizing in Christ, I want you to think of Romans 6. All right? Romans 6, look with me at verse number 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There it is, real clear in Romans. By the way, do you know of a better book in the Bible to explain to somebody the whole uh, miracle of salvation than the book of Romans? I don't know of a better one in the Bible that explains all that went on in our salvation than Romans. If you've ever taken the time to just a little bit at a time go through Romans and look at what it means to be lost and what it means then to be saved and to believe on Christ and have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. Romans does such a great job of explaining that. Well, Romans 6 is just a continuation of that to show us, look, let's not continue in sin because we're buried with Christ and we're also risen with Christ. Therefore, we need to live or walk, I should say, in newness of life. But not just Romans and Colossians. Look with me, if you would, at also Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter number 2. Here's some verses that I'm sure you will also remember. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 19. 
And I'm going to quickly read it when I get there. It says, For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, the word resurrection is not used or raised, but the same truth is there. I'm dead with Christ, yet I live with Christ. That is speaking of the resurrection of Christ and that I am raised with him. Look with me at Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. There's another Pauline epistle where this truth of the resurrection of Christ and how we are raised with him is presented. Ephesians 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. By the way, that's going to be applicable, that last phrase, to what we're learning in Colossians 3. So we are buried with Christ, we're dead with him, we are risen with Christ, and we are not only risen with Christ, we are where with Christ? Seated in heavenly places. Okay? So everywhere Christ is, that's where you and I are. Whatever Christ had, that's what we have. That is the beauty of the baptism that we have into Christ. Let's go back to Galatians chapter number 3. So again, we're talking about the command, and it begins with, if ye then be risen with Christ. But then right after that, in verses 1 and 2, it gives us a two-fold command. Here we go. Let's talk about the first of those two folds. First of all, it says, um, <clears throat> seek those things which are above. It says, if ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things. So the first command is that we are to seek. We are to seek those things which are above. We are to seek those things which are above. And above is where Christ is seated on the right hand of God. Those are the things that you and I are supposed to be seeking. Now, remember how I told you it ties into what it said in Ephesians chapter number 2, where it says that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. So doesn't it make sense then that that's what we would seek for? Because that's where we are. Our minds should be there, not here. Because that's where we're seated in Christ. That's how God sees us. We are there with Him in Christ. Why is it that we're so focused on this world and the things of this world? Those should not concern us. Listen, those should not be the thoughts that flood our mind. Our time and our effort and our energy should not be occupied with the things of this world when we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Our our seeking should be those things which are above. Above is where, as I mentioned, Christ is seated on the right hand of God. What is significant, this is a question now, what is significant about Jesus being seated on the right hand of God? What does that seated on the right hand of God mean? What is the significance of it? Well, the significance of it is this, that he has the power of that throne. To be seated on the right hand is to have the power of that throne. You and I, we may not understand that in our culture, but in the culture in which the Bible was written, a king, to have somebody on his right hand, that would be, his, that would be someone with the same or, or, or basically that power of the throne invested in him. And that's Jesus. Jesus is seated on the right hand. So we should be thinking and uh, uh, focused on and seeking those things. Why? Because Jesus is there and he has the power of the throne of God. That reminds me of Matthew chapter 28, and verses 18 and 20, where Jesus said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. See, we should be seeking those things. Why? Because he has that power, and we are in him. Therefore, we should be seeking to fulfill his plan. All power is given unto him. So not only should we be seeking those things, but notice what else it says. The second part of our twofold command is found in the beginning of verse number two. It says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So we should not only seek, but we should set. Set your affection on things above. Your affection should be toward God. What does the word affection mean? What do you think of when you think of the word affection? You, you probably think of something similar to love. But affection, of course, is a little bit different than love, isn't it? Uh, 
Love can have many, many different meanings in our English language as far as degrees of love. But the word affection means if I have affection towards something, that means my heart automatically is inclined to that. Uh, when my wife and I first met, for instance, I was thinking of that just today. She didn't know that. I haven't told her that until just now. She gets to find out just like you do. But I was thinking of the moment we met just today. Aw. Next week's Valentine's Day, by the way. Instant brownie points for me right there. All right? But I really was. I was thinking of the day we met. And I was remembering what that was like. And here's what happened the day that we met. Now, I did not love her at that point, but instantly I had affection for her. My heart was inclined toward her. I had a desire toward her. I was interested in her. My affection very quickly got put on her, and she began to fill my thoughts. That word affection has that idea, doesn't it? It's not necessarily love, but it is, hey, that, those are where my thoughts are. Automatically, when I have free time, that's what I think of. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. When you have free time, when there's nothing pressing on you, and you have opportunity to just think about whatever you want to think about, are the things that are above those things that automatically come to your mind? Does a smile come on your face when you think about the things that are above? Or is there something else that fills your mind that causes a smile to come on your face? Maybe it would be football or shopping or a thousand other worldly things that in and of themselves aren't evil, but they grab our affection, don't they? Set your affection on things above. It's a command. That means you and I are to take the initiative to put our affection on things above. It reminds me of Matthew 22 when Jesus was asked, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus' answer was, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. The word love is used there, but it says heart, soul, mind, and strength, which would include all of what we're talking about here. Our affection should be on him. I'm also reminded of what the apostle John warned the Christians that he was writing to. In 1 John chapter 2, he said, love not the world neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Listen, we are not to love this world. Our affection should be on things above. This, All of this, what we're talking about here, is being risen with Christ. Therefore, we should seek those things that are above. We should set our affection on things above. All of that was mentioned by our Savior in Matthew chapter number 6. Turn there with me if you would, please. Matthew 6. We'll be back to Colossians, but look at Matthew 6. All of this was mentioned in Matthew in different words. Now, if you remember, in Matthew 6, Jesus is on a mount near the Sea of Galilee. And he is there, and the crowds have gathered below him on that mount. There's a place in Israel along the Sea of Galilee where it is assumed that Jesus probably preached this. Who knows if they're right on the exact location. But it would lend itself to being a good location for Jesus to do this. There's a hillside where Jesus was probably up on the top part of the hill, and he would have been able to preach down towards the crowds. And I've seen that from the Sea of Galilee, and it's just an interesting place. Don't know if that's the exact place, but Jesus was teaching the multitudes early on in his ministry in Matthew 6. And of course, he's, he's going through the law, isn't he? And he's rehearsing with them what God really expects of them in the law. You see, they thought they were, they were fulfilling the law by all these commandments of men. But he was showing them, oh no, you're not doing nearly what you think you, or what, what you should be doing. Look at Matthew chapter 6. Start with verse number 9. We can't read it all, but verse number 9. Follow with me now in Matthew 6. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Notice verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Think about that, what Jesus is teaching us to ask for. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Could that be very similar to what we're told in Colossians? 
where we're to set our affection on things above and we're to seek those things that are above? What are the things that are above? Well, the Father's will is done in heaven. Isn't that what we should seek for? It's exactly what we should seek for. We should be praying for that. Lord, we want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse number 11, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from, from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive uh, you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Uh, moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance. Now look down with me, if you would, at verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Seek those things which are above. Right? Where moth, neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Notice verse 21, for where your treasure is, there will your, what's that next word? Heart be also. Set your affection on things above. You and I shouldn't be placing our money on the things of this earth. Again, we, we have to to some extent, don't we? Uh, we have to buy groceries. We have to put gas in the car, and we have to pay the mortgage and the electric bill and all those things. So we have to. But listen, beyond the necessities and a few things to make life palatable to some extent, listen, we should be putting our money in the things of God so that our affections then are up there. You see, if I'm investing in making myself rich and my life comfortable, where is my affection going to be? It's going to be in my bank account and in you know, how many square foot feet my house has and, and how fast my car is. But if I want my affection to be on things above, where should I place my money? In getting the gospel out to the world through missions. Or in, you know, buying tracts for the church so that the gospel can get out here. Or in, in helping my brother who has a need and, and, and helping him with something financially. And because when I put my money in those places, my heart will follow my wallet. And when I put my money there, my affection will be on things that are above. See, that's why the Bible says, set your affection on things above. If we look down at verse number uh, 24, no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? And then look down, if you would, uh, with me to verse number 31. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Notice what it says, though, in verse number 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Does that sound a little bit like what Paul was saying to the Colossians? Seek those things which are above. That's what you and I should be seeking. That's where our heart should be. That's where our affection should be. Well, we need to take the opportunity to seek those things and to set our affection on those things and friends, it's not going to happen by accident. We have to make a conscious decision. We have to lead our heart. Just like I talked about the day I met my wife, and boy, it was easy for my affections to be on her right away. But anybody who's been married for any length of time will tell you that doesn't continue for years and years and years by accident. Thankfully, my affections are still on her, but that's because she and I work at our marriage, and I continue to spend time with her, and I reject other women and reject other things that would take me away from her so that my heart is continually inclined to her. Do you know that I have to do that same with my Savior? See, the day I got saved, it was easy to have my affections on Him. I was a sinner in need of a Savior. I called out by faith on Him, and easily my heart was in love with Him because of His salvation that He gave me. But with time, the world pulls at my affections worldliness and the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches want to pull my heart away and I have to on purpose set my affection on things above. I have to on purpose shun and reject the other women, quote unquote. 
the other gods that would pull my heart away. And I have to set my affection on my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 3, let's go back there. Verses 1 and 2 are the command. Verse 3 is the reasoning. Why should I set my affection on things above? Why should I seek those things which are above? Verse 3, we've already talked about it. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Two reasons are given. You're dead. So why are you living for this world as if you were still alive in it? You're dead. Why are you living as if you were not dead? And your life is hid with Christ in God. Your life is in Him. Why are you and I living as if our life was hid in this world? Why are our affections so much on politics or sports or money or, you know, you can list a hundred things, can't you? Why are, why are our affections in those things? We're living at that point a lie. As if those things were applicable to us at all. They're not. I'm dead with Christ. My life is hid with Him. So why should I live as if it were something where I needed to uh, be concerned with this life. You and I need to remember that very much. When we are not seeking and setting, like Colossians 3 tells us, we are living as if we were still dead in trespasses and sins. And then verse number 4, what is the motivation? We've seen the reason. What is the motivation? Verse number 4, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You realize that in verse number four, there is a motivation for you to seek those things which are above. There's a motivation for you to set your affection on things above. When Christ comes, we'll be with him. We're, we're already there with him. But listen, when he comes, what is that coming going to be like? Now, we're not talking about the rapture here. We're talking about when Jesus comes to this earth for the second time. What will that coming be like? It's alluded to in verse number four. It will be in glory. When he comes, he's going to come in power and great glory to the point where those that are wicked and unbelieving will want to hide under the rocks and they will be afraid at his coming. And it will be a, uh, just a, a, an amazing and, uh, coming that will cause the people of the earth to be in awe of his coming. Well, in verse number four, it says that you and I will appear with him in glory. Why would my affection be on this earth when there's coming a day when Jesus is going to come to this earth and wipe all of this out? And I'll be with him coming to wipe all this out. Why would I have my heart and mind and my affection on these things that are all going to be destroyed, that are actually the enemies? And we'll see that later on in Colossians 3. The very enemies of the Savior that I am dead with and risen with and seated with and coming with, why in the world would my affection be on those things when I will be with Him in glory? Notice what, if you would, with me in Romans chapter number 8, we'll close with this. The motivation that I have is my heart and my mind should be with Him that someday He's going to come and destroy all of this wickedness. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9. We'll look at several verses here, so follow with me as I read. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. There is that truth again. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Uh, skip down with me, if you would, to verse number 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. Stop mid-verse right there. If we are heirs with Christ, that means that there is an inheritance that we will receive. Isn't that what it means to be an heir? Well, what is the inheritance that Christ will receive? Is it not this earth? There's other passages of Scripture that tell us that Abraham and 
his seed, who is Christ, will be the inheritors of all that is this earth. You and I are joint heirs with Christ. That's what it says. Middle of verse 17, now, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. We're going to be glorified with him when he inherits this earth. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. There's that glory. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Look uh, with me, if you would, at verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. As we close tonight, what is the reason that we struggle to have our affection set on things above and not on things of the earth? What is it that causes us to struggle to seek those things which are above? We have a lack of patience. You see, because living in this world, very quickly we're like a little child who's been told to wait for something and they get distracted. You know, there's candy over here. And the parent wants them, no, no, wait and be patient. Something better is coming. Yeah, but there's candy over here. And we're a little bit like that, aren't we? The Lord says, wait, and there's an inheritance coming, and you'll be in glory with Christ, and all of that is already given to you, and you have it all in Him, and wait for it, and set your affection on that. Don't get caught up in the things of this world, and we're like, yeah, but there's candy over here. And our affection is on those things when there's something far better that Christ has for us. And in Colossians 3, we are reminded, listen, you're dead to this world. You're dead in sin. You're dead in Christ. Now, you've been raised with Him and set in heavenly places in Him. So put your affection there. Seek those things that are there. Get your mind off of the world and put it on Christ and on His kingdom. That's what you and I should be seeking. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that we've had looking into your word. Help us to remember these things, dear Lord. Forgive us for the many times. Lord, just many times throughout every single day that we get distracted by the things of this world. Forgive us, dear Lord, I pray. Remind us of the need to seek you, to seek your things in heaven and have our affections there, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.